Hey there, everyone. Happy Thursday. Today on the final bar, another risk on day for stocks. The S&P pushing above 4,300. Nice day for risk assets. Bonds continue to rally as well post-Fed. The 10-year Treasury yield below 4.7%. Tim Hayes of Ned Davis Research is going to be joining us from Florida, sharing some of the macro charts he's following to make sense of these markets. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the final bar. Hey, everyone. Welcome to The Final Bar. I'm your host, Dave Keller. I'm the chief market strategist here at StockCharts.com in a rainy Redmond, Washington. Thanks for joining us every weekday after the close as we break down the market action based on the premises of technical analysis, the technical toolkit really designed in early on for individual investors to make sense of the markets, for traders to try to get a sense of things. When you had no access to information, you did have access to price. So it's one of the best ways of just measuring sentiment. I would argue here in 2023, even though market structure has changed, even though market participants have changed, even though it is a different world in so many ways, it is still uh, price as the most important metric to follow. Analyzing price trends, analyzing rotations and inflection points can tell you a lot about shifts in sentiment, about what we call a change of character in the markets. And I think you're potentially seeing one of those, right? We're seeing bond prices rally off of new lows. You're seeing interest rates come down off of fairly elevated levels. You're seeing stocks rotate higher, bouncing off of their low uh, from last week. Is this the beginning of a broader rotation? That's where we can look at some of the medium term and long term charts and see how much they've been affected by this tactical rally we've uh, observed so far this week. With that in mind, let's go to the charts and uh, dig into our market recap, see how the charts played out on this risk on day for equities. Uh, before we get there, we did have a poll going recently on our uh, social media platform. So make sure you follow us on X. Uh, subscribe to our YouTube channel. You won't miss the next poll. We asked you guys, will November 2023 be a positive month or a negative month for the S&P 500? Not surprised that 7 out of 10 of you basically said positive. Only less than a third of you saying a negative month. I probably have to agree, I guess. But I, this is a tough one for me, to be honest with you. I think we're right in that tactical rally phase, right? It's sort of enough that you have to understand that we're rallying off of the lows, right? Even if you're fighting the bullish case and sort of firmly bearish, you have to respect the fact that we're at very least in a bear market rally off of the lows. Uh, but it's not enough, I would argue, yet to show a broad rotation. A lot of, a lot of the medium term indicators I'm looking at are still pretty negative. A lot of the breadth conditions, not particularly strong enough yet uh, to declare an all clear with any sort of confidence. So we're in sort of that weird middle ground now, earnings are a big part of it, too. And I would say besides the Fed, the Treasury auction, which we kind of got through yesterday, we have Apple's earnings today after the close. We've had a number of other earnings that have come out. A lot of them have been fairly constructive here uh, with names like Starbucks and Shopify and Cigna and ConocoPhillips all gapping higher on earnings today. Let's dig into more of the market recap, see how things play out. And thanks again for uh, responding to that poll question Big update for stocks. And we talked last week about how the last hour of trading had been pretty consistently weak. You'll notice the opposite on a lot of days this week. We're actually seeing the last hour of trading be uh, fairly constructive. Today, for example, we didn't even pause, right? We sort of continued higher. Most hours finished higher than the previous hour. And we finished uh, toward the highs of the day, just below 43.20. The S&P 500 up almost 2% for the day. It's one of the biggest days, uh, up days we've seen in quite some time. Uh, finishing just below 43.18. The Nasdaq Composite slightly uh, less uh, positive, but still very much uh, up 1.8% uh, for the day. Mid caps and small caps. Look at this. The S&P 600 small cap index up 2.7%. So we've talked uh, recently about uh, the IWM, the Russell 2000 ETF, testing significant long-term support, bouncing nicely today off of the uh, previous lows. The VIX continuing to push lower not too long ago. We're talking about a VIX over 20. We're talking about a high volatility environment. We're talking about the risk off scenario that usually goes along with elevated volatility, meaning elevated fear, elevated uncertainty. It's being alleviated, right? The VIX is actually coming back down, down another point plus today to about 15.6. Let's go to uh, the bond markets. Fixed income markets overall uh, popping higher today. The TLT, the ag pushing higher. The TLT was up 2.3%. Uh, uh, the yield curve overall moving lower. The 10-year point, which we often uh, quote down to around 467. The long bond yield down from over 5% now to almost 4.8%. So you're certainly seeing bonds rally off of the lows. We talked about that 
bullish divergence that we'd observed, that seems to be playing out pretty well. We'll look at that chart here in a minute uh, if you uh, missed it from earlier. Dollar coming off a bit today, uh, down about half a percent from, uh, from yesterday's close. Overall, stronger dollar has been the, uh, the general uh, theme over the last couple months. Looking at commodities, the DBC is up over 1%. Gold and silver mix. Gold was up about a third of a percent. That's using the GLD. And the SLV, a silver ETF, down about half a percent. Energy prices moving higher with crude oil, natural gas, uh, gasoline all moving to the upside. Finally, cryptocurrencies mostly in the red, particularly Bitcoin and Ethereum. Now, these are still pretty good levels relative to you know, most of 2023. We talked about that ceiling around 30, 31,000 for Bitcoin. Uh, Bitcoin now powering above there here recently, sort of toying around that 35,000. We had that big rally off of, or sort of that push above 31,000. We got up to 35K and now kind of stabilizing around that level, sort of like we found a new plateau uh, for, uh, for Bitcoin. Ether holding above uh, 1,800, now even though down 2% today. So again, some strength here recently. The question is, are they able to hold those uh, recent gains? Finally, looking at sectors, a lot of big numbers here in the sector return list. This is a pretty strong day for, uh, for stocks. The only reason why the major benchmarks aren't up a lot more, given these sectors up, because these are some of the smaller sectors. You ever have real estate uh, and energy? These aren't, you know, they're, 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 they're there, right? They're, they're S&P 500 names. It's just relative to some of those FANG sectors, a little less of a weight for sure, if not a lot less of a weight as a result. Real estate up over 3% isn't really moving the needle on the S&P too much, but Again, REITs at the top of the list up 3.1%. Energy, number two, up 3% today. Consumer discretionary, the XLY up 2.6%. Tesla had a pretty good update. Uh, that's certainly helping propel the XLY to the upside. On the downside, the worst performing sector today was still up 1.3%. So when I talk about a risk on move, it's not just offensive sectors were up and defensive sectors were down. It was kind of an everything up and it was just up a lot or up a little but everything was in the green. So consumer staples, communication services, both up 1.3%, and that's good enough to be at the bottom of the list of the 11 sectors. After that, it's uh, healthcare and technology from the bottom. Let's go to a chart of the S&P 500 to sort of check in on what's happened. So what has happened is this week has been quite a reversal, right? Last week was all about weakness, was all about you know finishing toward the lows of the day, particularly Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. There was a lot of not so much optimism going into this week. You know, last week, as I'm writing a note for my premium members at Market Misbehavior, sort of a negative feel to things as in we're going, you know, we're certainly seeing all, showing all the signs of going down. But the caveat was we've gone down so much. We're at the lower end of this channel. The breadth indicators are so negative, it's almost positive. It's kind of what we're seeing playing out today. So what's curious about this move here, obviously, a lot of optimism in stocks. You look every day this week, closing near the highs of the day. We gapped higher today on the S&P 500, so really pushing up. We're now at a trend line uh, using the most recent lows, right? The, or the most recent highs, that is, the September and October high, kind of right at that level, not too far above uh, current, uh, today's high. Now, so overall, nice rally off of the lows of the, uh, of the trend. But a lot of charts, to be honest with you, you, can draw a trend line off of the highs for the last three months. And I'm thinking in particular of like, uh, you know, the QQQ, the um, uh, semiconductor ETF, right? If you look at the chart of the Qs, kind of this nice parallel uh, trend channel. And as a reminder, to draw a parallel channel, draw line number one, which I'm doing here. I'm making it nice and thick just so we can see it. And then on the Mac keyboard, you want to hold down the command button, click on that first line and drag it down. I am sure there's a similar version on a PC. I have not used a PC in a long time, so I don't know what the key, maybe Alt or something like that. It's one of those, but there is a key. I know on Mac cap keyboards, this little command button, you click on that and then tap the, uh, the first line. You can drag and make a parallel channel. Just look at what a consistent downtrend channel this is from the July peak to where we're at now in early November. And, and the reason why I'm bringing this up is because we've had this really good rally, but I think you could still see this as a similar rally to what we saw in early October, similar to what we saw in the second half of August. What was consistent there is we kind of went to the upper end of this channel and then rotated lower. So reasonable to expect a bounce off of the lower end of this channel, arguably also reasonable to expect a rotation lower when you get to the upper end of this channel. We'll see. The momentum has continued to improve. So on the Qs, the RSI is just below 60. And if you look back here in October and late August, that's what usually happens in a bearish trend in a bearish phase when you rally off the lows the rsi often stalls out around 60 kind of right at that uh, important point for the Qs. 
Can we get above 370? That would get us above the October high, above this trend line. The RSI gets above 60. That, I think, would be a strong vote of confidence in strength, you know, following the traditional seasonal pattern of strength in November and December. We stall out here, though, and all of a sudden, I would argue 2023 starts to look a little more like 2018 than uh, 2021, right? More of a, a, a year where you actually sold off in November, made a low in mid-December before rally into year-end. So something to think about as some of these charts approach some key levels of potential resistance. You know, two charts that I want to share. We did our monthly chart review uh, for our Market Misbehavior Premium members uh, just earlier today, a couple hours ago. Two of the charts I just want to highlight that we went through among uh, many others. One would be uh, bond prices. And we've talked about uh, you know, yields coming down, which we're certainly seeing more of that. My guest today, by the way, um, uh, Tim Hayes of uh, Ned Davis, uh, really excited to talk to him about rates because we've, we've seen quite a shift, certainly, in the bond markets in the last couple of weeks. Uh, you know, the TLT, the ag, made lower lows in October, but the momentum actually sloped higher, and that's usually the sign of downside exhaustion. It usually tells you we're ready for a bit of a bounce. We kind of see that. And the question is, is this the beginning of something further? The ag is getting above its 50-day moving average today. The RSI is just below 60. So similar to the Qs, kind of testing the upper end of that reasonable range given a, a bearish phase. I think the same can be said for bond prices. And the question is, is this the beginning of, uh, of a further rally uh, in bonds? The other one I would tell you is with the, uh, with the small cap uh, ETF, the IWM. And you know, we're looking at this weekly chart of the uh, Russell 2000. And if you look... The highs back in 2018 and 2019 line up very well with the lows from 2022 and also the lows from the last couple of weeks, right? We kind of come back to the same level. It's IWM around 160. And if you look so far, we're bouncing off of that level. I'm curious if that ends up being the lower end of this uh, basing pattern yet again. Are we set to resume uh, or return back to the upper end of this, uh, of this range? So, you know, things like the idea of bouncing off of a potentially a reasonable level of support uh, and again, lining up with, uh, with last year's lows. Uh, to continue on with our market recap, we have a couple more minutes. I just want to uh, focus on a couple things. Number one, strength in the FANG stocks. Uh, we'll look at Apple here in a moment because that's an earnings name here after the close uh, with, again, a heavy earnings week uh, similar to the last couple weeks. I just want to highlight Tesla, obviously up over 6%. That's propelling the XLY to the up, upside very well. NVIDIA up almost 3% today. Uh, that, of course, coming off of a, of a new swing low just a couple days ago is a hammer candle at the bottom for NVIDIA, so a nice bounce off of that candle. And Apple actually rallying 2% leading into today's uh, earnings after the, uh, after the close today. Um, you know, only one of the Magnificent Seven stocks, or the Magnificent Seven plus one, uh, as I have here, uh, and, and Meta's the only one that was actually down today. Everything else pushing higher. So some of the biggest names certainly having a, uh, a positive day. That's helping our major benchmarks uh, move to the upside for sure. Let's dig into some earnings names just to, to finish things off. We had a number of names that reported at, uh, before the open uh, today. Starbucks is one of those. Gapping higher. It was up over 10% earlier today. It came off a little bit going into the close. And I think that's interesting. When you have a stock that gaps, we've talked about this many times recently. The gap, is, a lot of times, is hard to predict, right? It's hard to really be able to determine a binary outcome with earnings, right? Is this stock going to be up or down 10% tomorrow? But what you can do is feel, uh, feel out what happens after that gap, right? So what happened is we gapped a, a higher at the open as investors sort of digested the earnings. Through the course of the day, we traded higher, but by the close, we actually went down just below or actually right at the 200-day moving average, it looks like. This gap took us up to the highs from June, July, August. So it's interesting to me that we've gapped up to a pretty well-established resistance level, and then we're trading down. So getting above 102, 103 would really be enough to complete this push higher. But I think Starbucks kind of right at that level of resistance might be an important level to watch uh, through, uh, through the remainder of this week into next week. Shopify, another really interesting one, gapping higher. And again, a nice gap getting back above moving averages. Last week, we're talking about this stock making a new three-month low, continuing to deteriorate. Nice earnings win today, up over 20%. So a big gap higher. And again, the question would be tomorrow going into next week, We've now gapped higher. We've reset expectations from around $48 to $59 a share. Do we see additional buyers coming in willing to pay $60 more uh, tomorrow into next week? It's all about upside follow through. Now, there are some charts that actually have been working that today's earnings were just the next or the latest uh, good news in a, in a chart that's actually working quite well. Cigna is one that I'll highlight. 
Uh, this is in, uh, in the healthcare sector, if you're not familiar with it. Look at this level around 300. That was the high in early August. We traded up to that level. We gapped above it, pulled back, and tested that level as support. And now we're rotating higher. So today's uh, move higher is right there, but that's after a successful test of uh, support, which was resistance back there in, uh, in August. So a nice upside follow through in a sector that has not been particularly strong, healthcare. But there are a group of stocks in there. I mean, we've highlighted names like United Healthcare, UNH, um, others. Cardinal Healthcare is coming up here, uh, I think, tomorrow uh, before the open. So a number of, uh, of stocks in the healthcare sector are actually fairly constructive. I think it's important to not just write off the whole sector, focus on some of those areas of a particular sector showing uh, signs of strength. Now, after the close today, we have uh, a couple names to highlight. Apple is one, uh, you know, trading higher, about 2% today. We'll check out the earnings uh, so far, not too much of a change uh, from, uh, from today's close, up about a, a third of a percent. Uh, currently trading just above 178 in the after hour session. Again, after hours, a little less liquid, uh, a little more uncertain. We'll see what happens during the earnings call. And certainly tomorrow, you'll get a sense of where uh, during the normal uh, trading session, how uh, investors are trading Apple after earnings for now, kind of a muted reaction, if any, uh, to what's happened after the, uh, after the close. Coinbase is another one reporting uh, after the close today. Coinbase actually gapped higher, all, up almost 9% today, up to around uh, just over 84, uh, around 84.60. Currently flat in the after hours uh, trading. We'll see what happens with, uh, with the uh, report there. What's interesting about Coinbase, it's essentially one of the ways that equity investors can kind of directly access the crypto space and not set up a digital wallet is buy a stock like Coinbase. So it will be interesting to see, given the strength of uh, Bitcoin and Ethereum off of the lows, Coinbase bouncing off of support around 70, right around the 200-day moving average. Now at the upper end of that uh, basing pattern. Square is another one. We talked about Shopify having a pretty good, uh, pretty good day after uh, beating earnings before the open. Square just came out after the close. It was up over 7% today, just below $44 a share. It's currently after hours trading uh, just about $50, so up another 14%. So obviously a good initial reaction. Again, as always, we'll see what happens during the earnings call. There's going to be a lot of volatility uh, around the uh, the earnings call tomorrow. We'll see how that how that's looking. But for now, it appears to be gapping up very, very nicely back above the 50-day moving average for the first time since August if we would trade around those current levels. Finally, two other names before the open tomorrow, just to keep in the back of your mind, Fubo was up almost 15% today. They're reporting before the open uh, tomorrow. And I think what's interesting about this particular chart is that uh, it's been sort of in a consolidation pattern. It's an interesting play on streaming networks and all of that and seeing if there's a, enough of an improvement. It really has been languishing here in this range for quite some time. It's down in single, low single digits. Is this provide an upside catalyst to push it out of this range and push to the upside? Open question there for Fubo. And then CBOE, and the reason why I'm highlighting that, two things. Number one, it's probably been one of the stronger charts in the financial sector, which has not been particularly good. This is not a bank or anything. It's really more of a uh, you know, a, an exchange data provider is really their, their main business. What's interesting, though, from a technical perspective, we have a couple concerning patterns. The trend has been positive. We're seeing a bearish momentum divergence recently. Higher highs in price, lower peaks in momentum. That's kind of an issue. Today, we actually had a bearish engulfing pattern uh, distributing a little bit going into earnings tomorrow morning. So keep an eye on that chart. We'll see if there's enough of an upside catalyst to keep this trend going. I'm seeing some technical signs that suggest uh, more weakness going into next week. That's our market recap for today. A lot of charts, a lot of earnings, a lot of things to cover. Uh, we'll uh, bring on today's guest, Tim Hayes, here in a moment. Before we do so, just a quick reminder, we love hearing from you. We would love to answer one of your questions in our next mailbag segment. And those mailbag questions come from people like you trying to use stock charts, trying to use technical analysis, and letting us know uh, what questions are, uh, are coming up. Email is always a good way, thefinalbar at stockcharts.com. On X, just tag us in a comment, at finalbarsctv. On our YouTube channel, of course, you can drop a, a note in the chat during a live broadcast like this one, or just put a comment below the video you're watching on uh, any of our Stock Charts TV programs. We'd love to hear from you and hope to answer one of your questions in our next mailbag segment. I want to bring on today's guest, Tim Hayes. Tim is the Chief Global Investment Strategist at Ned Davis Research, coming to us from Sarasota, Florida. Tim, how are you? It's good to see you. Good to see you, Dave. Thanks for having me on. No, it's a pleasure. The last time you and I met, I think, was at the CMT uh, Symposium back there in the spring in April. I feel like the world has evolved quite a bit since you and I last spoke. So I'm very curious to see. We've got a lot of different catalysts moving things, a lot of uncertainty around the Fed. Some of those questions answered, but I think still uh, for a lot of investors, 
uh, kind of a challenging uh, environment to get their head around. We're starting with the chart of the 10-year yield. When you look at the interest rate environment, what is that telling you here? Well, I think I'm starting out with showing that, you know, one of the most important correlations and developing correlations has been this uh, developing inverse correlation between uh, bond yields and stock prices. So, you know, this really explains why the market got on the defense of not only recently, but back in February and March. And, mm. and then, you know, it looked like uh, maybe the market was getting ready to bottom out and then bond yields had another push higher. And but now finally we get to um, early last month, and then you know it looks like uh, bonds are pretty bond yields pretty much run out of steam, and we started to see some divergences, and now bond yields are rolling over. And um, you know we always want to start with the price, of course, uh, but one of the questions that kept coming up was what's driving this, and and to me it was mostly sentiment because if you look at things like inflation expectations. And there was so much focus on this whole supply issue that kept yields going, but it almost felt like, you know, sort of that last run up in yields when you had a macro environment where the Fed's going on hold and uh, the economy is slowing. You know, we have, it seems like they pulled off a soft landing, inflation coming down, inflation expectations coming down. All those things normally you would expect to see bond yields uh, at best be stable and most likely go down. So I think what What's happening? We does look like we've reached uh, the end of this um, this run up, and that should be good for equities. Yeah, and you mentioned the correlation. So the series at the top, just so everyone knows, is the correlation, rolling correlation of ten year yield and the S and P five hundred. So it's sort of negative correlation implies yields coming down, probably more bullish for for stocks, right? I mean, is the general way way to read that? Yeah, and and actually, this is uh, one of the concerns I had. If you go to take this chart all the way back to uh, the 1970s, you know, back then we also had, that was the last time we really had an inverse correlation between bond yields and stock prices. Mm-hmm. And what happened back then was that, um, you know, inflation was such a big issue and was such a negative driver for equities and earnings expectations that bond yields uh, and bond yields were taking off the upside. So stocks moved into a secular bear market from, from 66 all the way to 82. Mm-hmm. And by the time we got to 1980, uh, and, and especially in 1982, when we reached a secular low in equities, by that point in time, the Volcker Fed had broke the back of inflation with double digit rates. So bond yields began this 20 year downtrend. And so, you know, we still had an inverse correlation. But if for most of that time, bond yields are falling, well, that's that's good for equities. And equities got into a secular bull market from 82 to 2000. It wasn't until 2000 when inflation was pretty much no longer a threat, we were down below 4% on the yields. And, and then the correlation turned positive, but it was really more, um, you know, the market's concern was more about deflation at that time, not inflation. So rising bond yields was actually seen as a positive. And so then after that whole secular bear market from 2000 to 2009, um, you know, we had finally the global financial crisis, the response to this with uh, the liquidity that effectively reflated the economy and the correlation stayed positive until last year. And that's why last year was uh, really the big worry was that we've moved into a different environment where, you know, bond yields are going to be um, now running back into a sustainable uptrend with inflation. And then that would bring us back to the 1970s and 80s. So mm-hmm. I, I'd go through all that to say that, you know, anything where that indicates that maybe bond yields are no longer going up and potentially starting to recede again, you know, that's going to be relief for, for the stock market, which is really reacting negatively to the shift from, uh, you know, positive correlation to a negative correlation last year. Mm. No, that was, a, that was an awesome history lesson, uh, by the way, Tim. I, I brought up as you were talking, went to our, what we call our historical chart gallery, looking at a long-term chart, monthly chart of the long bond deal, just to show that period and, and sort of what, these, what, these, uh, what rates have looked like over the long term. You know, we had the Fed meeting, obviously, yesterday. We had Powell's press conference. No real surprises in terms of no change in rates. Doesn't seem to be a lot of likelihood of another of any change at, in the December meeting. When you look forward into the beginning of next year, where do you see the 10-year yield? Where do you see rates going from here? What does that mean for risk assets? I think we'll probably move into more of a trading range. And, and as long as you don't have bond... Now, if you, if you have sort of the... Uh, I'll talk about volatility in a moment. We talk about the VIX. But, but you know, if you have less bond volatility, then that, that's going to create less uncertainty mm-hmm. about something like this chart developing again, where people are going to start to be, you know, less, less worried about bond yields becoming that big problem for stock for stocks over the long term. So mm-hmm. um, I think, uh, you know, I, I think we'll probably see a trading range unless we go into 
you know, if, if the market starts to discount a recession, but I think a trading range in bond yields would be also consistent with the Fed going on hold and sort of maintaining um, rates where they are. And, and, you know, a lot of people have said, well, you know, the stock market can't do anything until the Fed cuts rates. Well, for the last five times, the stock market has actually um, rallied from the last rate hike to the first cut. And I think I think what explains that is that by the time the Fed is done doing what they set out to do, which was to bring inflation under control, well, then, you know, it's, it's a much better environment. And, you know, and the only big exception was in 2000 when mm -hmm. the Fed uh, went on hold. But, that, but, but the problem with then was that the economic, economic outlook was so dire that stock market you know, sold off anyway. But, um, you know, if the Fed's got this right, then I think... Um, you know, bond yields maybe move in a trading range with, with uh, you know, the, the Fed keeping rates on hold. And that should be a good environment for equities. But, you know, we'll mm. see. That was well said. We, we were talking before we went live, uh, Tim. You reminded me, of course, Ned Davis, which I've, I've followed you, you guys and, and your work for, for quite some time. Very data dependent, very focused on, on the evidence and what's, what's happening. I think a lot of people are sort of, you know, thinking if the Fed could start lowering rates, wouldn't that be a great thing for stocks? But you're absolutely right, right? Stocks actually often recover, and then the Fed starts to take action kind of after that, right? Um, yeah. Your chart of volatility is next. Let's look at the VIX. The VIX, of course, had spiked above 20. We sounded a bit of a warning sign of, uh oh, VIX above 20. This could be interesting. Volatility's now come down. Talk to us about what you're interpreting in the change of volatility here recently. Well, you know, so I showed I, I showed this chart because, you know, it's similar to that um, inverse correlation between bond yield stock prices, the inverse correlation between the VIX and, and the market. And, and one of the more, again, one of those stable correlations when the VIX market gets on the defensive, the VIX goes higher. What And, and, and so what I think we should also pay attention to is if you look at the trend of the VIX since 2022, it's been making lower highs and lower lows. And I think we'd need to be concerned. And we have an indicator where we uh, we try to just determine at what level does the VIX really become a problem. And what we found is that if you get above 28 and a half after having been at a very at a very low level for a very long time, which was the case in 2021, you know, we had such low volatility for so long. And then the VIX spiked above 28 and a half. And even though the market's down when you have those kinds of spikes, you know, it was really the beginning of a much longer term period of hot volatility, high volatility and falling stock prices. And so, you know, this this continued, but then we started making lower highs in the VIX. And I think right now, you know, if, if this market's really going to get into trouble, if you would see the VIX start to make higher highs and get above that 28, 28 and a half level, you know, I think that would be a concern. What we found is when you get above there, um, you get out, there's been 10 cases since 1990 when that's happened. And the median drawdown has been uh, 20, 21 percent after that. So the market's already down. You have a rising day. So the market gets even weaker afterwards. And this last time, the you know, last signal in in November of 2021 was followed by a, about a 24 percent drawdown. So this is one thing I think I think right now the VIX looks pretty encouraging. The fact that it didn't go to a higher high and now it's, it's coming back down again. The other way to think about it is if you get to the low volatility and this is what happened in 2020 I and mean, it stays down there for too long. Well, that's often a warning sign that maybe the market's gotten too complacent. And, mm -hmm. and yeah, there was a degree of that actually, um, you know, we, we saw earlier this year. So that's kind of how I, I think about the VIX. Yeah, no, well said. I, thanks for mentioning that 28 and a half uh, level. It's, and it's so interesting, that average decline you mentioned, that's after that, and which usually means the market's probably sold off up until that point. Um, okay, that's a level I, I will definitely uh, jot down. I would encourage others to do as well. You know, just to finish off, Tim, when you think about these conditions, if rates, you know, volatility is, li is lightening up, if, if yields are starting to come down, if that continues and, and stocks start to rally, when you're thinking from an asset allocation perspective, is this the time to more go risk on? Or is there something you have not seen yet that you would want to see to feel confident in, in expecting some upside for, uh, for risk assets here? Well, I think everything you talked about earlier, I, I, I agree. We really need to be watching the market breadth and see if we if we start to see a decisive, you know, kind of days like we had today, you know, could be the early signs we're going to get that broadening out and get a breadth thrust, which would be, and but we're sort of at a point we haven't yet had that. There's a lot of, you know, potential signs of encouragement. We, we do a lot of work with sentiment. We get to extreme pessimism and sentiment turns. Mm. That's usually a sign. We're starting to see some of those indicators are, are turning around. November, December, seasonally, and it's the strongest time of the year. 
If you look at two month periods, um, the period of July and August tends to be the weakest and, and fourth quarter generally tends to be strong, but the November, December period is strongest. So that's in the market's favor. And, and, and the other thing is, I, I kind of alluded to this earlier, we've been in a secular bull market since 2009. And when you're in a secular bull market, some of these tendencies uh, tend to be much stronger. And you've had um, about a 5% rally over the next two months. And, and over the next six months, markets up 9% on average after a bad October. So I was looking right. at like, when you get a bad October, is this a warning sign or is this an opportunity? If you're in a secular bull market in particular, it's often an opportunity. And you think, look at that and think about the sentiment um, having reached an extreme. And now we're starting to see the breadth come through. I think things are setting up pretty well, but it's just not, not, not all the pieces are there yet, but uh, I would say it's probably time to take on some risk here. Tim, this was a, an absolute pleasure to have you on the show. Thanks for bringing some charts and some insights with you. Please give our best to Ned and the team down there and uh, send some sun our way if you could and take care, Tim. Thanks, Dave. Thanks, Dave. Good to talk to you. That's Tim Hayes. Tim is the uh, uh, Chief Global Investment Strategy, uh, Strategist at Ned Davis Research from Sarasota, Florida. Um, really interesting thoughts. And I, that, would, that uh, comment on the VIX was a really interesting one. What I love from Years of following uh, Ned Davis's work and the team there, incredibly capable and, uh, and thoughtful team of strategists, very evidence-based. And there was a lot of when this happens to the VIX, here's what usually happens a month later, six months later. Some interesting thoughts about the short-term fluctuations we've seen now, some of the longer-term implications of what that means. Great comment at the end there about what a week October usually means in a secular bull market. Great take there and a pleasure to talk with Tim Hayes of Ned Davis Research. Folks, we've got to wrap the show and go to the three in three, three charts in three minutes that tell the story of this market environment. Here is chart number one. We're going to start with earnings. I mentioned some of the stocks reporting uh, today before the open, after the close, and tomorrow morning. Of course, uh, we're sort of getting toward the end or through the end of uh, earnings season here. An interesting one to be sure. And this week in particular, we're seeing some interesting beats to the upside. You know, I'm struck by a name like Cigna. We have a special episode of this show tomorrow. I'm sitting down with uh, Grayson Rose to talk about top 10 stocks for November. We did not mention Cigna, but some other healthcare names did make it on our 10 charts. So I'd encourage you to watch that uh, episode tomorrow. Cigna, a nice win today. And again, it's the latest swing high in a pattern of higher highs and higher lows. I think that's a constructive chart really beginning to threaten uh, a new all-time high. Starbucks and Shopify, a little different, right? Look at the uptrend leading into earnings for Cigna. More of the downtrend, the sideways choppy trend that you saw with Starbucks and Shopify, both of those gapping higher, but gapping into resistance. So on these types of names, after a win, but it's sort of threatening resistance, the question is, is it able to hold? Do you see additional buyers coming in, pushing names like Starbucks and Shopify higher? Chart number two, Tim Hayes mentioned a couple comments there at the end about sentiment. So I want to highlight that the AAII survey came out today. This latest in the weekly survey, 50% uh, bears, just over 50%. That's one of the highest readings. Actually, it might be the highest reading we've had so far in 2023. So interesting, uh, really coming off of the new swing low and initial rally so far this week, sort of a, a, the most bearish that the survey has been uh, so far year to date. You can see the spread from bulls to bears around 26%. It's one of the more negatives, negative readings we've seen in 2023, looking a lot more similar, to be honest, to 2022 than to 2021 in terms of the severity of the bearish sentiment. Certainly something to watch and, and certainly next week to see if some of those bears change their tune. Finally, I'm noting some divergences here, and divergences are often sort of a leading indicator in the technical toolkits telling you something may be a little bit different. We're seeing lower lows in price in October here uh, for the XLRE, this is the real estate ETF. Look at the higher lows in momentum. Gapping higher today, real estate, the top performing sector here, still a lot to prove, I would argue, before you consider this an uptrend, but it's showing that early sign of, uh, of improvement. The most important thing on a sector like this, I would argue, though, is the relative strength, right? There are only a couple sectors that have been consistent outperformers in 2023. It's communication services, it's technology. Maybe it's something like energy at times this year, but something like real estate, Utilities, even with the nice re re reversal, still have a lot to prove on a relative basis. Folks, that's a wrap for the show. I want to thank you so much for joining us every weekday after the close for the final bar. A special thank you to Tim Hayes of Ned Davis Research joining us from Sarasota, Florida. Don't forget to like and subscribe to our channel. 
before you go. For Stock Charts and Reb in Washington, I'm Dave Keller. Be well, stay safe, have a good night, and smile. Say Stock Charts.